Hi, and uh, welcome to VMware Tech Marketing Session for November 5th, 2021, in a new video series. We're going to be trying to tackle some of the popular messaging that's coming out today in cybersecurity, and uh, that is going to be the journey to zero trust. With us today in the virtual booth, I have myself, Andrew Osborne, and I'm part of the VMware's tech marketing team, and as well as my esteemed colleague from the office of the CTO, Dennis Moreau. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, great, Andrew. I'm delighted to be here. Great. So, you know, I was uh, noticing that, you know, you'd actually put in, uh, I think, last, what, eight years with VMware? Is that correct? Or thereabout? Yeah, yeah. And a few more years before that in the portfolio with both RSA and uh, EMC and the, uh, the CTO offices there. Yeah. So it uh, looks like you've got at least uh, 20 plus years in cybersecurity overall. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually started uh, back in, uh, undergrad school and operating system security, uh, attempting to crack things like the Multics operating system. And that was probably 70 something, 76, 75. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I tell people I've had over 20 years in cybersecurity and they scratch their head and they're amazed. I'm like, yeah, I remember the first job I had when the guy at uh, Saber American Airlines handed me this thing and said, hey, this is a firewall. Can you read the manual and figure this thing out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the wild, wild west days. But uh, interestingly, though, you know, I, I know that we had pseudo worked alongside one another across the uh, aisle on certain different public sector uh, community and working groups before. But it's great now that we're actually having a chance to uh, work directly together on the same team and to try to tackle some of these uh, very challenging uh, questions and concerns that are coming up within the industry today around, you know, ultimately, uh, this uh, breakdown that we're going to take for our first of the four episodes uh, today. Yeah, as challenging as the problems are, you know, the solutions can be almost as challenging as we'll <laughs> see with uh, Zero Trust. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, in regards to uh, Zero Trust, uh, this uh, is going to be a 10 to 15,000 foot view for today's session. Obviously, we'll get into and expand on some of these topics in the further episodes. But today, we'd like to take uh, this time to try to get our viewers uh, uh, right-sized and familiarized with some of the guts of uh, Zero Trust and the evolution of uh, where uh, we have come from and where we're at today with it, what Zero Trust is and what it is not, and you know, get around some of those tricky points. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, we'll uh, get things kicked off and uh, you can tell us uh, and go over well, what Zero Trust is for us. Well, you know, Zero Trust kicks against a background and uh, uh, an evolution uh, in cybersecurity that's come a long way. Um, we started with sort of the recognition that we needed protection that wasn't in the failure domain of the applications we're protecting or the systems that we're protecting and instituted things like firewalls. And they made a ton of sense, but there were basically two zones inside or outside the firewall. Um, mm -hmm. We at some point realized that probably wasn't granular enough for the various use cases and scenarios that we had to worry about. And so we began looking at uh, levels of separation that went beyond that. And then, of course, we begin seeing attacks that were systematic at how they went at our defenses and had to step beyond just firewalls to intrusion prevention systems and uh, those sorts of things. Um, but as the attackers got more fluid and more dynamic, uh, we wound up dealing with not just known kinds of attacks and things that we could understand ahead of time, but the emergent stuff and their visibility became the center of, of things. But as a consequence, we wound up with portfolios that had you know, 50, 60, 70 different portfolio elements in the security portfolio and a level of analytics that wound up looking at telemetry and signals that were different in every enterprise because their portfolios were different and the things they were protecting were different and their risk appetites were different, um, squarely making complexity uh, a serious challenge. And what we begin to realize is that, you know, the, the attackers are calling the shots. They're dictating the terms of engagement. They're deciding when to attack and what to attack on a series of seemingly endless uh, potential vulnerabilities. And in the face of that, um, we, we see uh, the new set of challenges. Uh, nothing could be more clear about those challenges than the 304 million uh, ransomware attacks uh, uh, last year. Uh, each of them costing about $2 million in, in average cost, whether or not you paid the ransom. Um, and then separately, um, of course, the supply chain attacks. Um, we had that whole uh, colonial pipeline thing, right, which compromised uh, 
uh, 4,000 miles of, of smart pipeline with uh, programmable valves every so often down the pipeline. Uh, the problem is we had 400,000 miles of similarly vulnerable in infrastructure. So as bad as the supply chain attacks have been, they could be orders of magnitude worse. And that is what's got us looking at a completely different way of doing things. You know, and you talk about visibility, and I can only remember, you know, those old adages of garbage in, garbage out, right? It doesn't really matter, you know, how much information you're getting. I mean, if there's no one there at the wheel looking at the information and trying to process that, I mean, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, to that portfolio standpoint, of the, you get all this information being thrown at you, unless you have some, you know, spectacular way. And I know that there was an evolution of, you know, where SIM and SIM, you know, came together and uh, trying to alleviate some of those problems of those old days. I don't know if you remember those, you know, IDS days of just all the signatures and all that data that's being collected off the sensors and, you know, then into the IPS realm and, you uh, you know, there's certainly you're I think you're harping to those that have been around the industry know, you know, that these things have been around for years. So it's not just, you know, uh, uh, you know, a newfangled thing that has come up in the in, in the daunting task of, you know, trying to reel in all of these different areas uh, you know, that you bring up a great point on that supply chain, too. You know, I think about, you know, beyond the colonial pipeline thing. Uh, you know, there, there's been issues with the uh, supply chain from just hardware vendors. You know, you remember the uh, uh, different uh, IoT uh, en enabled uh, malware that came out that, you know, basically, you know, was rampant, taking advantage, full advantage of, you know, easily guessable or or uh, those that hadn't been reconfigured default admin admin passwords on routers or or uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points. I don't remember those uh, uh, attacks, uh, you know, those things are going to continually be issues about that supply chain and then what devices you can trust, right? At the endpoint to the servers, to the, you know, moat uh, and, and bridge and drawbridge around the uh, castle. It was spot on. Uh, we don't know how to build perfect stuff. And because of that, there are always in things some non-zero chance that a uh, uh, an actual vulnerability is going to be exploitable in, in a deployment scenario and in an operation. And we have good, good evidence that uh, the attackers are already inside in almost every organization at this point and in the supply chain. What that says is that we should not probably start with the assumption that we've got a clean environment. We should actually start with the assumption that um, <laughs> we've got a compromised environment and that affects um, how we should approach security in a fundamental way. Um, we probably don't have a point at which we can guarantee we're training on normal data that's uncompromised. If we train on data that has active uh, malware capability within the environment, we're making that malware behavior part of the environment's normal. Uh, and in that circumstance, we've got to consider what do we do about that? Um, so, so Zero Trust very much tries to recognize that in at least two fundamental ways. The first is it attempts to apply uh, concepts that relate to, for instance, least privilege, getting access to only the things you need, not just from the point of view of the user where least privilege is an instinctual thing we've always sort of paid attention to, but from the point of view of the service account, from the point of view of the application, <laughs> from the point of view of, uh, you get the picture. The point is to very granularly, intentionally decide what do you need access to to do your job and enforce those at a granular level. Now, that does a couple of things that are interesting. It carves up the environment into compartmentalized sets of chunks. And what that does is limit the blast radius of presumably already compromised parts of applications and services and the infrastructure that's in the environment. Uh, secondly, when that stuff tries to do reconnaissance and lateral movement against an environment where you're saying you do this and only this, then you're going to break lots of glass and make lots of noise. And that's exactly what we want. So first, we get blast radius containment, a level of resilience to attack even in the supply chain. And then separately, granular instrumentation on even east-west traffic going in the environment that guarantees to raise, raise the alarm a lot earlier than these things that are sitting around undetected in uh, enterprise environments for months uh, with no real signal. The fundamental way to make sense of zero trust is to take take to heart that really clear assumption that the environment is already compromised and that we bring containment to what was otherwise just a protection story, uh, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. You know, and then that, I don't know if you saw just recently, there was a Cambridge report that came out that uh, there was already 
a well-known uh, compiler uh, issue. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. I mean, literally, that seemingly opens the door that you know all code cannot be trusted. That there is potentially uh, inserted, you know, malware or or malicious uh, code or code that is you know privacy uh, or uh, security imposing, um, you know, to an organization or an enterprise on you know what it might do once it's you know introduced on the backside of those. Typical traditional moat and bridge and drawbridge, you know, uh, tactics for protection. And until you know this kind of uh, framework and zero trust that you've talked about here, about you know the the trust, you know, uh, you know not being implicit, uh, but rather trust and verify, um, and the compartmentalization of all those elements, and and more importantly, you know, uh, uh, hiding the crown jewels, right, ensuring that the the data that they're actually going for has the protections in place that you're talking about in this framework of zero trust has uh, been long overdue. <laughs> yeah, and, and so the, the point is bringing the plan to bear, as you're suggesting, uh, zero trust requires that you pre-classify the data intentionally and decide how important is it, how critical is it that if I grant inappropriate access or I don't grant necessary access to it, what does that mean? That's the view of risk that Zero Trust embraces. Taking that intentional classificational decision that happens by the enterprise and making it part of the plan, which then allows you to craft, craft the cybersecurity architecture that sometimes re, um, called the uh, reference architecture, uh, that, that is the view that Zero Trust policy has of your infrastructure that, that makes all kinds of sense at that point. But there's work to get there. And that work is uh, not at all your, your grandfather's uh, least privilege. It, it really steps beyond them. So let's talk a little bit about the enforcement side of this. Um, I know you've covered a little bit on the Zero Trust and Zero Trust architecture realm uh, for what Zero Trust is. Maybe we could uh, go over the enforcement side of this. Well, yeah, you got to ask yourself the question, uh, why would anybody embrace something so disruptive, so very different than our previous core competencies, something that's going to enforce um, it, motivate um, so much change uh, in our environments to, to get things done. Um, we, we are having new legislation, new regulation, new standardization occur at a time where we have unprecedented compromise of the way we've been doing things um, in, in, in the face of, of uh, ransomware attacks and uh, seemingly endless series of supply chain attacks, all of which could have been much worse than they, they have been. Um, in those circumstances and against that backdrop, um, nations have, have decided time to encourage something completely different. So we had uh, um, earlier this year, the White House executive order, what was it, 14028, uh, that mandates movement towards zero trust, among other things, including supply chain visibility, the development of uh, software bills of materials. So you have a declared manifest of here are the parts that make up the thing you just bought. So you get better visibility into those parts and their vulnerabilities in the enterprise uh, all the way across the board to encouraging uh, a much more rigorous level of logging, much more complete levels of logging and the requirement to provide attestation that you're doing all that stuff to folks who might be procuring these products in the federal and non-federal parts of the federal supply chain, which is a huge, huge market, if you, if you will. Absolutely. And yeah, to your point, I mean, without some of this on the end of it being around mandates and, and policies. I, it's not that I don't think that folks that are a part of the ecosystem of enterprises, agencies, you know, public or private sector, uh, don't want to take in uh, those, you know, elements and, and, and put them in. But obviously, you know, business is run at a lightning speed and taking in those steps and trying to, you know, operationally put them in. I mean, I think we all can, you know, have some empathy and some grace that, you know, it's, it's a challenge to weigh out the speed of the market, speed of business versus the implementation of uh, safety uh, uh, mechanisms that typically are somewhat disruptive. Uh, you know, I don't think that, you know, anyone is naive to think that, you know, trying to look at zero trust as a technology concept and zero trust architecture as a deployment architecture guided by those mandates and framework are going to be easy to put in and they're going to take years to, to develop and, and hone, right? Well, it's clearly recognized by NIST and CISA and NSA and all the other folks that are uh, 
doing the job of facilitating how we move this stuff forward. Uh, so a lot of really smart folks are focused on how do we make this happen and how do we make this happen in a time frame that's looking more like the one and a half to two to three year time frames where the actual business requirements are to make progress on the plan, to do the um, uh, analysis and inventory of all the devices and all the services and all the things that people who need access and the things they need access to and classification of both data and the criticality of functions to uh, sort of uh, agency mission and the objectives that they have to achieve. Um, so this is a forcing function. It is one that is going to push us outside of the comfort zones, but there is a systematic effort um, and it is aimed at a, a coherent uh, single direction. There's one definition of zero trust that matters, not in. And because of that, um, there's a focus to the effort and the resourcing and the movement that's occurring. Um, and there is a recognition that we're shooting and moving target, that we're going to be learning as we do this stuff and going to need to course correct as a consequence. Um, so I don't think that this is the Pollyanna approach that says sprinkle some zero trust pixie dust over your applications and life is going to be good. There is a real recognition of the level of work and effort uh, going on here. But there are some questions that get raised. As complex as this is, that document that defines zero trust, it's about 60 pages long. Um, so there's a fair bit of complexity in just saying in detail, what is zero trust? And sometimes it's useful to focus a little on maybe what zero trust is not as a way to get some boundary around sort of our conceptions and get some, some instinct into how we understand it. Yeah, well, you certainly, I think you nailed it in that, you know, know what you're protecting. Uh, it's uh, a movement and that movement is moving at shooting at a moving target. <laughs> so uh, to your point, uh, maybe we segue that now to what zero trust is not and uh, break it down by maybe some uh, myths that are around zero trust. Uh, like myth one, uh, that zero trust can be achieved for any infrastructure application. Yeah, the, the, the core understanding there is you know, zero trust uh, presumes that you're uh, able to implement policy at a fairly granular level. Well, big conventionally developed systems that have been around for a long time weren't always built um, out of composable parts. Uh, and because of that, breaking them up into cleanly defined boundaries on which you understand the interactions um, and that can, in a performance or, or operations perspective, tolerate being broken apart like that, that's just not true for all existing applications. In fact, it's probably not true for the vast majority of existing <laughs> applications. But that transformation, that, that move from existing application to a componentized, containerized, microservice based kind of implementation of the, the same application, that is a, uh, a long process and uh, has not been uh, profoundly successful in every, every attempt to do so. What that means is the transformation to uh, a pure zero trust environment is going to take years for significant pre-existing applications, although Greenfield stuff will be able to move a whole lot faster. Um, and at the same time, the assets are going to change, the tolerance for risk is going to change, the attack profiles are going to change, nothing's going to freeze dry and sit still uh, while this occurs. That says that zero trust and, and non-zero trust is probably going to coexist for the foreseeable future, that not all applications, as CISA points out, uh, will be able to survive the transition. What will happen is some applications will be rewritten or replaced in order to get towards zero trust. Some um, may not may not make them a journey at all, and other policy structuring mechanisms will be used to to right. to put those in place. Well, that's a good point, and at least uh, there is some evolution in the industry for microservices and containerization and whatnot uh, for how you know applications are developed and deployed uh, to to lean on. And to your point from even earlier that you know the coexistence of some of these technologies that are already in place are just going to be you know either leveraged or uh, revamped or retooled to accommodate uh, uh, that zero trust architecture. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's do the next uh, myth then uh, on it being just least privilege. Well, you know, at the, the very highest level, if you squint and sort of fuzzy, fuzzy your, your perspective enough, you could reduce it to least privilege. But if you do, you miss a couple of things. The first is that uh, it's about least privilege, but it's about least privilege applied all the way down from the user 
down through the service account credentials, down through uh, the API tokens, right? It's that the parts that you have in a system have access to only the things they need access to. So if they're compromised, that they're going to break glass when they try to do something they weren't designed, tested, or verified to do in the first place. So what happens is you get least privilege, but you also get these other disciplines like least functionality. And because compromises can act so fast, remember uh, gone in 60 milliseconds, Rick Jones demonstration that a serverless function could compromise the underlying Linux instance in a very short amount of time, uh, <laughs> thereby persisting. Well, in those domains, right, you had 60 milliseconds. What that says is that the policy I enforced on these granular uh, containment boundaries in a zero trust environment need to be very close to real time and in line. Um, and that's because malware can move fast. Reconnaissance and lateral movement can happen really quickly. Um, but it also says that continuity of enforcement uh, turns into a questioning of something you pointed out earlier. The environment is compromised. That means identities can be stolen. So I can't just say you authenticated as this person, therefore you are this person. That's a mistake. If the environment is compromised, then I can certainly take um, an already privileged service that already has um, authentication associated with it and compromise it and have behavior on behalf of it begin occurring in the environment without creating yet another instance. In doing so, um, what you have to do is have also continuous verification. That is, you recognize authentication and you verify that authentication's behavior uh, for the associated user and its consistency, both across peers and over time, are consistent. So you can decide, I can still trust that authentication. <laughs> continuous <laughs> verification becomes part and parcel of the story. Um, and so um, that, that adds why, to- Why does services XYZ, why is it making SQL calls? <laughs> Yeah. appropriate for that. Well, or how is this no. user both in Houston <laughs> and Beijing at the same time, right? That's, so. <laughs> is that Ukraine? Is that a base of operation for us? <laughs> well, no, it's not. Well, that might be a problem. Yeah. And how frequently has that bitten us over the, the recent years? Yeah. They've made a thousand calls in the last hour. Is that typical? Well, no, we only do one that in a day on our busiest day. Yeah, I think There's that's also like probably, yeah. <laughs> that extends to the devices and, of course, to the servers and the environment. So it's truly supply chain. Uh, and the whole point is to look at the integrity of those, the posture with which they're operated and their behaviors. Um, and this says that that happens continuously. Well, we can do those things continuously at very fine scale for individual components of applications and individual uh, server instances. And that says this enforcement happens logically very close to the asset that's being protected. Uh, it can't be too far away from that lest you overwhelm uh, whatever your own policy enforcement point is with covering too many assets with way too much fidelity. Right. Um, but there's lots of opportunity for caching. Um, I decide to trust an application based on its testedness. Well, that testedness is established before I ever deploy. So I know how well it was tested and how conformant that was um, long before I deploy. I can cache that and make it available in tagging, in grouping, in metadata instance services, and just consume the fact that that thing you know, met my requirements for trustability um, on an ongoing basis and just test the state of it. So an awful lot of what Zero Trust leans on um, is capturing context from other part, other life cycles. Development is one of those. Governance is another one of those. Threat intelligence is yet another. Uh, and those are very, very efficient things to test uh, in real-time policy enforcement material. Let's go on to the next myth. Uh, so uh, speaking of uh, the trust relationships, uh, Zero Trust is realized by implementing uh, end user platform or workload platform or just the gateway alone. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. Think about what the end user device knows a lot about. It generally knows a lot about its user, but not a lot about those backing services that you're talking to and all of the users they talk to. So the vantage on the end user device is to be able to characterize the behavior, the integrity, um, sort of the, the state of the user and the device that they're using. But it doesn't say a whole lot about the assets they're interacting with that are back in the hosted uh, infrastructure and environment. In the data center, however, we know a lot about the service and every user that touches the service, but not a lot about the end users in terms of the other things they interact with. 
Well, if I'm going to get high confidence in the verification that you're who you say you are now, as opposed to 60 milliseconds ago, um, and that the service that I trusted uh, 20 minutes ago was still something I should be trusting on an ongoing basis, I need both vantages. I need to be able to have access to the hosting environment and into the end user platform concurrently, and they both contribute to the zero trust proposition. Now, how do I match that up? Possibly by establishing some policy at an intervening gateway that says, <laughs> only if you meet my requirements in terms of sort of verification and intention um, and ongoing behavior as a device and a user, and if you meet my requirements in terms of the testedness and the um, curation and provenance of the application I'm talking to, then and only then does my enterprise policy allow that communication to occur. And when it's out of kilter, when you start behaving badly, then I stop the interactions at that point. That is an interesting containment semantic, and that does goes a long way uh, to stopping threats evolving in environments, even when compromise already pre-exists in the environment. Yeah, I think I had to coin a new phrase: uh, uh, app fencing or service fencing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> for this activity, what you know, <laughs> sitting in front of the community to to achieve when you're talking about that. I mean, it sounds like you know uh, what you know is on the identity management side of you know MFA or you know multi-factor authentication on crack. I mean, to be able to you know break down you know these multiple factors of you know uh, assurances uh, for that. It's going to be certainly not done overnight. Uh, well, yeah, but we have do we have compelling analogs. I mean, when when we were in World War II, floating liberty ships, basically big balloons, and one, one torpedo hit and those things were going down. But what do we do as a consequence in the design of aircraft carriers? Lots of watertight containers, so one torpedo doesn't take down the whole ship. This is exactly the same strategy, right? Uh, right. Compartmentalize in order to be able to contain damage, in order to enhance your ability to localize where it occurs in an actionable context that says, where do I turn the knobs and dials to do something about this? Where do I reprovision in a targeted way to achieve resilience? Um, that, that really is a very compelling and simple strategy if you squint enough. <laughs> it does take connecting the dots across a bunch of moving parts that haven't always been connected. Uh, dev, for instance, in operations. There needs to be an intimate connection to do the automation required to make Zero Trust sustainable. Otherwise, we're going to have thousands and thousands of log writers, um, right. incident alerters, and need to do a whole lot more correlation than we've been doing. Absolutely. So I know we've already touched on this, but maybe on that myth four, we can do a wrap up on the executive order on this myth that it is a immediate implementation. I think we've already established that that's not going to be true just from the sake of the complexities that are involved. But yeah, and the best insight we have into this is, of course, the Office of Management and Budget, the guys who control agencies' access to budgets, the ability to uh, do what you need to do in terms of spending priority. Um, and the latest of the OMB uh, memos, which are now in public draft for us to pay attention to, uh, indicate that what they're looking for in 2024 is progress along the way of getting my, my hands on all of the identities and roles that need access to stuff, all of the devices that are operating in an environment, and the ability to detect sort of drift off of, um, uh, for instance, jailbreaking or uh, posture or behavior and to do something about it at that level. Uh, the um, establishment in the network of encryption, even on east-west traffic and DNS lookups going on in the environment, uh, the ability to connect the dots from the application to the development chain so that about every application that you see at runtime, you can get to the information that says it was adequately tested, it has known provenance associated with it, um, it is operating in the environment and hasn't been modified uh, post-deployment in the environment, so level of immutability, that those things are all testable in policy at runtime. Um, but uh, it doesn't say you have to have formulated all of your zero trust policy uh, for all of the enterprise at the granularity that's being described um, and operationalize zero trust in the same time frame. So what we have is the launch of a journey on which the planning has mandates. Uh, some of the mandates are within the next 60 days, um, accommodate the new 
um, requirements associated with the uh, the OMB um, uh, memos into your planning in moving toward zero trust in that two year time frame. But it also says in the next thirty days, identify a primary contact point uh, for NIST to talk to and CISA to talk to about moving the ball forward. But also about learning as this thing gets implemented as to what's working, what's not, and what do we need to to do better. We're engaging in a process, a journey. Um, and what the customers um, really are looking for is who's the trusted partner to help them accelerate getting there <laughs> with confidence. And what do we do about all the stuff we already have? How do we bring that into the picture? Some of the questions are unanswered. And, and of course, those are the opportunity to move forward and contribute huge value to this process. I think you're already, though, putting a pretty uh, large, sizable first step on that foundation block when you talk about inventory, yeah. trying to inventory all of your devices, endpoints, services, applications, API calls. It's and classifying uh, all that data. You're classifying all <laughs> of that, right? <laughs> and the data. I don't, I, I don't think anyone who uh, is in the know of these types of things uh, is going to suggest that even that first uh, uh, building block for that step is going to be an easy one. Um, hopefully, uh, um, the, the community at large is going to have uh, uh, help and assistance uh, um, along the way. And I believe that, you know, if you really look at it, uh, there, there are already a lot of resources out there. So um, again, uh, really thank you for your time, Dennis, for getting on here with me. And uh, don't forget, you know, uh, Dennis, I will be uh, covering uh, the rest of these uh, different difficult topics around the journey to zero trust and the next uh, several weeks. Uh, every couple of weeks, we'll be putting this out. So there'll be four total episodes. So check back in with us here on uh, on TechZone, uh, themeware.com. And uh, as uh, we suggested, there are a lot of resources out there. And uh, I would uh, be uh, more than glad to make sure that uh, in the uh, blog, we have a link uh, to this. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with some of these resources around cybersecurity best practices um, and the framework around them, um, you know, a lot of these are, are government driven, but... Um, what's good for the gander is good for the goose. A lot of the uh, private sector uses these as well as a, a great foundation for building out uh, their cybersecurity policies and uh, framework as well. Um, any parting thoughts, Dennis? No, I think we're, we're engaging on a, a journey that, as you said, is complex and we're going to be learning about it, but uh, well worth doing uh, one of the, the ways that we're actually going to get off defense and dealing with security and uh, the consequent cultivation of trust in the ecosystem. So, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic and enthusiastic about moving forward on this. Sounds great. Thanks again, and until next time. Thanks, Andrew.